Uh, okay, so very good morning to all of you, uh, to the chairperson, Professor Sivaraju, and uh, discussant, Professor Abu Salih Sarif, uh, and uh, the uh, other, uh, I mean, the paper presenters of the LASI team of IAPS. Uh, good morning to all of you, and also those who are participating in the uh, in this plenary session. Uh, there are already 43, uh, you know, participants are there in this session already. And uh, uh, I think Professor Sivaraj and uh, Professor Abusile Sarif, uh, you know, doesn't need uh, introduction because these are all well-known names uh, to all of us. Uh, Professor Sivaraj is associated with Tata Institute of Social Sciences and Professor Abusile Sarif served in N NCR for a long time. And uh, so Professor Shivaraju will chair this session and Professor Abusile Sarif will act as a, uh, you know, discussant. And we have a rapporteur, Dr. Selvamani uh, from IIPS. And uh, there are four papers in this session. So now I will uh, give, give the floor to Professor Shivaraju. Professor Shivaraju, you please take over and you can conduct the session. Yeah. Good. Uh, we have one and a half hour, na? am I correct? Uh, exactly, yeah, one and a half hours, 11.30 yeah. to 1. Yeah. We have already so, exceeded uh, five minutes. So can... Yes, yeah. but uh, we have listed, uh, we have been given a list of five speakers. Professor Sekar, Professor Mahanti, Professor Aparajita, Dr. Deepthi, Dr. Right. Salam Padgonka. Right, right, yeah. Five, 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 five. Uh, exactly, five, I'm okay. sorry, uh, I told four. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, Thank you. So, uh, I suggest that uh, given the time, uh, we will. Uh, re I request uh, each speaker to devote uh, ten minutes of their time. Is that all right? Yeah, it is followed to you to manage the time. Yeah. We were, so then, uh, we were uh, given uh, yeah. fifteen minutes time. Yeah. Okay, Professor, fifteen minutes is all right. Yeah, fifteen minutes. Time. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, without going uh, much of our time, let's me. Just to begin with, thank you, uh, Professor Sekar, uh, Professor James, and uh, the team of LASI for uh, this uh, the opportunity for uh, giving me to this uh, ch to chair this session. And it's a very important uh, uh, that uh, we have a exclusive session. I congratulate you for devoting exclusively for LASI by one uh, um, uh, the complete uh, um, analysis related to the background of this LASI project and also the major findings in uh, areas of uh, economic issues, health issues uh, and uh, uh, other social psychological issues. I think uh, given the, the India's demographic transition and also population aging that is picking up, LASI has come in the right time because uh, all these years we are struggling in the absence of data and that too a representative national level survey data which is very much required because as you all know that uh, the policies, programs, and also the various schemes uh, targeting for uh, needy elderly is very much uh, 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 required. And for that, the data generation through LASI is a very, very welcoming one. We are all awaiting for so many um, years. So now it has come true, and uh, it is our responsibility to utilize and also to guide the policy makers and program managers so as to see that our elderly's well-being are taken care of. So with this, uh, I am very happy to introduce, uh, to begin with, uh, Professor Saker. Uh, Professor Saker, uh, I don't think uh, any uh, need any introduction. Uh, currently, he is the overall in charge of LASI one I heard. And I think uh, to begin with, overview of uh, uh, the LASI and also the me methodological frameworks and all these things to begin with, I think Professor Saker will be introducing. Now I request Professor Saker to begin with. What we will do is uh, five speakers will speak for 15 minutes each. And at the end, uh, if any questions answers, we can have it. And then uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Abu Salim Sharif, uh, I will request after the presentation of each speaker, there can be a discussion. And then uh, is this order is all right, Professor Saker? Or uh, after all the presentations over, the discussion can come, then questions, I think. That is yes. Yes, that's what I am requesting, Professor Sharif, to come after five speakers. Now, Professor Sekar, it is for you to uh, introduce the LASI project. Yes, please. Okay. 
thank you professor shivaraju and uh, the share option is uh, not at given to me the share right okay thank you thank you professor shivaraju and a very good morning to all of you uh, we are very happy to present before you the, an overview and some of the important findings of the longitudinal aging study in india nasi i will be presenting uh, now uh, the scope relevance and the methodology of the nasi and followed that four of my colleagues will be presenting some of the important findings related to uh, various domains of the lasi study lasi as you are aware lasi is a major initiative of the government of india jointly with the international institute for population sciences to generate a scientific database for india's growing elderly population and this becomes very important in the context of the rapid population aging transition happening all over the world particularly in the developing countries and india is no exception to that <coughs> as per the 2011 census we have around 9% of india's population considered to be 60 plus or senior citizens that will be approximately 100 100 million older people in india but this scenario is going to change drastically in the next 2 to 3 decades by 2050 it is expected that we will have around 20% of india's population as elderly that will be around 320 million elderly population in our country but if you include the pre retirement phase that is the 45 plus onwards that population will be almost 600 million people in india by 2050 so we are this is going to be a major challenge not only for the government but also for the families individuals and communities given this scenario in indian context we do not have any sufficiently nationally representative data set for older persons aged 45 and years and above most of our national surveys large scale surveys including the national family health survey district level household surveys and most of the surveys were carried out by iips essentially focused on the maternal and child health issues by interviewing women in the reproductive ages 15 to 49 years and we are also seeing in indian context from age 45 onwards or age 50 onwards an onset of substantial premature burden of non communicable diseases and this is also the age a critical transition from late adult to to the elderly situation so in the in the absence of any internationally comparable data to understand the various dynamics of socio economic and health dimensions of aging in our country and to have a globally acceptable data lasi is a response of the indian government and all the collaborating partners to fill that important gap so lasi is india's first nationwide longitudinal aging study and in terms of its coverage scope and sample size it is the largest longitudinal aging study in the world now international institute for population sciences iips is the nodal institution in carrying out the lasi lasi is supported and financially sponsored by a national program of health care of elderly under the ministry of health and family welfare government of india national institute of aging usa and the united nations population fund unfpa india uh, we are also having uh, international collaborating partners the harvard thn school of public health and the university of southern california our national collaborating partners are the 19 regional geriatric centers under the ministry of health and family welfare located in various states 
ICMR National AIDS Research Institute located at Pune for storing and conducting, uh, storing and testing the uh, dried blood spot test for the LASI. And we also have a technical consultant from the Chest Research Foundation from Pune for uh, helping us in, conduct, uh, in analyzing the lung function test and spirometry test. Let me also place on record the significant contributions made yeah. by uh, the former Indian PI of LASI, Professor P. Arogyasamy, and the PIs of our collaborating institutions, Professor David Bloom from the Harvard School of Public Health and Professor Jingu Lee from the University of Southern California. LASI team is also guided by an expert group of uh, professionals, the National Technical Advisory Committee, chaired by Professor P. M. Kulkarni and also the International Technical Advisory Council, chaired by Professor James Smith of Rand Corporation. So their advice and suggestions also help in um, taking the LASI uh, program forward. And so a group of dedicated team of survey experts, research, IT personnel, medical professionals across the institutions worked hard for the last so many years to bring out this scientific database for India. Let me also mention the contributions by the various survey organizations and field agencies in successfully conducting the uh, field implementation of the LASI study in, across India. Now, with LASI, India is entering to an allied club of health and retirement studies. This, uh, starting with the United States health and retirement study, across the world, nearly 40 countries are having the health and retirement studies, the English aging study, the European health and retirement study. In Asia, in Asia, we have the Chinese health and retirement study charts, the Japanese study of aging and retirement, JSTAR, the Korean longitudinal aging study, CLOSA. So LASI is an end entry into this allied club of health and retirement studies. What I want to emphasize here is that though the Indian specificities and Indian requirements are also taken into consideration while designing the LASI uh, instruments and survey, we are also kept in mind the, the, the studies and the instruments and protocols adopted by similar studies across the world. So LASI provides yes, us an opportunity to cross-cultural comparison across the states and across the countries. Uh, what are the important goals of LASI? LASI collects data on the internationally comparable research design tools by adopting cutting-edge scientific uh, methods to provide a credible and acceptable data for national level policy making and long-term comparative scientific research. As you also provide the much needed scientific data for strengthening Indian governments, particularly Ministry of Health's national program for health care for elderly, NPHC. LASI data will also enable strengthening the existing social security and pension policies of Government of India for elderly. And it will also help in developing a comprehensive national health policy framework for uh, older persons in India expanding the health care and social security programs in our country. Now, LASI broadly covers four subject and policy domains. One is, the, and most important one is the health domain, which includes the disease burden and risk factors. It is not only the self-reported health condition, but it's also the actually measured through the uh, health examination. And we also have a big section on health care and health financing. On the social front, information on family, social network, and social security and welfare programs. In the economic domain, we are covering the income, wealth, expenditure, assets, pension, and many other issues. So let me give you in one minute what are the issues we are covering in the health dimension. We are, we are able to get a robust, robust estimates of the prevalence of communicable and non-communicable diseases of adults and elderly in India, by its states, by rural urban, by various socio-economic categories. We can also compare the self-reported and measured health conditions, and which will provide an assessment for total burden of disease with a particular focus on non-communicable diseases and the risk factors associated with that. 
as it will also enable us to understand the risk factors and social determinants of communicable and non communicable diseases including the economic and environmental factors and also to assess the, the demography of aging transition happening in a country like india we also have the data on the healthcare utilization by pattern and diseases by the choice of healthcare services and providers health expenditure and also the treatment cost and healthcare financing health insurance coverage and out of pocket ex expenditure including the catastrophic health expenditure and the quality of care uh, in the lasi individual questionnaire the health section is very elaborate lot of information of the morbidity diagnosed chronic diseases including hypertension diabetes cancer lung disease heart psychiatric conditions other health conditions and endemic diseases mental health is a major component of lasi including cognition and depression measured through various scales functional health through activities of daily living adl and instrumental activities of daily living impairment and supportive devices healthcare utilization hospitalization inpatient and outpatient visit and cost of treatments women's health family medical history and health health behavior including smoking alcohol consumption involvement in the physical activities and exercises and food security and many other information one important component of lasi is the direct health examination and biomarkers we have the functional health measurement like blood pressure and pulse rate lung function test through spirometry vision test near and distance we have a set of anthropometric measurements including height weight waist and hip circumferences of the selected individuals lasi also collected the blood samples dried blood spots and for testing for c reactive protein crp glycosylated hemoglobin hpa1c and hemoglobin and we also have performance based test grip strength that is a one of the best indicator of the uh, the healthy aging time to walk and balance test so this is a one important component of the lasi data and information coming to the social dimension it includes the multi generational family structure living arrangements uh, the financial support participation in social activities involvement in social organizations and the support received and provided by the elderly care taking by the family members who are unable to perform their daily activities participation of older people in social organizations community activities the perception of the elderly with regard to the lack of companionship their isolation that the everyday discrimination they experience and the ill treatment or abuse experienced by the elderly both within the household and outside the household and also to understand the satisfaction of the older people with their life as a whole and different aspects of the life in the economic domains we have the information on the older persons and their economic vulnerability first time lasi also an attempt to gather information about household income expenditure assets and debts employment retirement pension perceived economic security vulnerability and we also have the data on the economically active older population workforce participation and job characteristics of the older indians the housing conditions and to understand the extent of poverty and food security among the older populations in india so what are the important innovations of the lasi lasi provides a comprehensive subject coverage which has a big uh, section on the health and biomarkers the economics of aging the sociology of aging transition happening in india we have a comprehensive set of biomarkers through direct health examination lasi use the computer assisted personal interviewing capi in order to provide the quality data and in order to minimize the errors uh, during the data collection and data processing and also use it based technologies including gis and other methods now lasi research design provides you estimates for the india as a whole and for all the states and union territories we are able to complete survey for all the states and union territories except for one northeastern states because of some local issues that is sikkim but we are now in the process of completing that survey in sikkim shortly uh, lasi study population includes 
all the men and women aged 45 and above and their spouses irrespective of their ages even if they are less than 45 years of age so lastly households are at least having at least one person aged 45 and above and uh, that is a lastly age eligible households all together we have now 72250 individuals aged 45 and above which includes 31000 elderly persons aged 60 uh, uh, if you include the sikkim data which will be coming shortly within a month we'll have another 1000 more individuals added to that so lasi design is a longitudinal design prepared to carry out the survey for the next 25 years the first wave survey was carried out in the 2017 and 2018 and we are planning to have the second wave by 21 22 so the plan is to have to follow the same individuals and the same households for the next 25 years on a periodical basis on every 3 years to track the social economic and health changes happening to elderly and their households now basically lasi uses three survey instrument one is the household schedule canvas one per household which includes household roster housing environment consumption assets and debts household income and household health insurance any knowledgeable adult member from the household or a, set, a group of household members can provide information to this lasi individual schedule is more elaborate it is on demographics family and social network social security program disease burden functional health family medical history mental health and health behaviors and as i mentioned earlier a big set of biomarker collection healthcare utilization work employment retirement and pension we also have a certain experimental modules uh, focusing on certain issues which is canvas to the one fourth of the sample responded one important and interesting dimension of lasi is the community schedule unlike many other surveys lasi have a community schedule for both rural and urban areas the information about the localities or the villages where the survey was carried out including their socio economic characteristics infrastructure facilities including health education access and availability of various social security programs and welfare programs for the people in those villages so this data providing us to compare or to assess the individual and household behavior along with the community characteristics uh the as, as you are aware the lasi report was released by the honorable health minister uh, dr harsh vardhan on 6th of january this year and the lasi report and fact sheets for all the states and union territories are available on iaps website for download and the lasi data also released to the public domain in january 2021 and those of you who are interested to use lasi data please write to iaps and you will be getting the data uh, if you have any further questions and other things please write to lasi thank you very much and uh, my colleagues will make the presentations on the various important findings of the lasi on different domains thank you very much hello yes uh can i start now i think you can start okay yes. screen is visible Uh, screen is visible hello yes yes please go ahead okay okay, okay. okay. Uh, thank you so i will be uh, uh, talking about the economic well being of uh, elderly in india so this is uh, findings from the uh, lasi uh, lasi survey uh, the basic so uh, uh, you know as we know and uh, economic well being of households is key determinants of 
elderly health and uh, then uh, this is the economic information which was collected in in lasi is quite comprehensive so it it uh, includes a wide range of economic measures so starting from household consumption um, uh, household income um, household assets debts so there are uh, details uh, uh, health uh, expenditure as well as uh, um, uh, subjective economic well being so the the uh, economic models uh, almost uh, uh, accounts so maybe one fifth of the uh, instruments which is quite extensive in nature however there is there are two issues when we uh, deal with this uh, this topic particularly the measurement involving at household level and at individual level uh, the the measures such as consumption uh, uh, the estimate of catastrophic health spending are primarily done at household level and the household comprises both uh, elderly as well as non elderly members so in my later part of my uh, uh, presentations i will focus to segregate it elderly and non elderly households with a related analytical structure as as the individual characteristics also includes uh, their work employment insurance and so so in this uh, I, my presentation will be primarily focus on household uh, uh, economic well being though it is a, any comprehensive measure must focus both household as well as individual characteristics so what i uh, know the the analytical plan is so these are the five key variables that we, that uh, we uh, uh, will be focusing during the discussion basically primarily uh, we will uh, on with refer reference to household consumption the the standard analysis includes health expenditure but what i have uh, uh, done is i segregated the uh, uh, health expenditure i have taken out health expenditure from the consumption expenditure and name it as household uh, consumption expenditure excluding uh, you know uh, health expenditure because for this group of population health expenditure constitute a, a larger um, um, share and the the general uh, generally so it is found that they you know the the consumption expenditure is higher for the uh, elderly households and possibly and that is what one of these reasons is of inclusion of health expenditure so some of these analysis on the latter part i will be showing it with household uh, you know without and with health expenditure the uh, the key summary measures of uh, uh, consumption expenditure that is monthly per capita consumption expenditure i will also be uh, focusing little about the uh, the extent of uh, uh, catastrophic health spending with a simple measure so how does it where it varies by each type of households and uh, this is again this is these are all household measures and similarly there are uh, there are a lot of information on household um, uh, income so which has been uh, collected in in, in lasi so few things i will be putting for that so i will not be covering asset and debts and subjective well being those are uh, they are uh, in the report because i thought uh, with a uh, because of a time limit and all these things so i will not cover this uh, two variables and uh, just to begin uh, with uh, this uh, uh, the overall let me so as uh, as has been pointed out so last year survey covers 45 plus uh, households that means members with 45 plus and their spouses so this is the uh, out of the uh, overall era 42000 uh, 940 uh, plus households are being cover of which more than 72250 individuals are covered so based on this around 43000 uh, uh, households so you can see that this is the uh, the general inference which we got with reference to consumption variable the key economic variable on uh, the two of the variables i am uh, putting here one is monthly per capita consumption expenditure so that is and uh, and food and non food share of in mpc so if you see this is the the, the overall mpc is around uh, 3000 uh, for this 45 plus households which is bit higher than the overall estimate what we have seen from the uh, nss estimate of around uh, 2000 plus so and if you, it, it it follows is higher in urban and rural as expected so and with reference to the share of food expenditure you can see here overall about half of these expenditure are on food and half is on non food 
and this is the, the, the relative share of non-food expenditure is little higher in the urban area and rural area. So speaking basically this is the validity of the consumption expenditure data in the, in the, uh, in the last survey. And with reference to the state pattern what we found is the general ranking of the states with, a, with reference to consumption expenditure remains similar. So what we see the, the better of states have the higher level of per capita expenditure. So such as Goa, Chandigarh you can see on the top and on the bottom hand uh, you, you have the poorer states with the lower per capita uh, consumption expenditure. So in general this variable which has been the consumption expenditure variable which has been integrated in, in LASI survey provides a more reliable uh, and robust estimates not only for the uh, country also across the states of India. So if you show that uh, how does it, it varies in the share of uh, food and non-food expenditure uh, which is also a kind of a indicative of the uh, states uh, you know, uh, economic well-being as well. The poorer states tend to have a relatively higher proportion of expenditure on, on food. You can see here the poorer states for example, Bihar, Assam and so they have a relatively higher share on food expenditure compared to uh, other states of, you know, better of states where uh, it is relatively higher in the non-food expenditure. So this also justify that this is the, the, uh, the data is, is, is relatively better. So now with reference to income, the questions on income in Lassi was asked in a much uh, a person manner uh, knowing this difficulties in obtaining the household income data and more in a systematic fashion. So if you see here the differentials of household income with the uh, you know, per capita income with the uh, households with the, with the elderly and without elderly, uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, uh, we can see here there is a higher income at least you know, among households without an elderly member than those with a elderly uh, members. This is possible because I uh, know uh, because uh, uh, no, we know beyond uh, after certain age. So uh, this is older is also characterized by by you uh, know uh, absence uh, from uh, work and and so. So if you look into the distribution regarding the uh, the income from the different sources, wage and salary also accounts about two third of these uh, more than two third of your of the total income which is also, but on the other hand, the pension just is accounts only 5% of the, of the income. So, which is relatively much lower compared to uh, any, other, any other places. So, now uh, with this, uh, I just wanted to focus a little more with reference to elderly and non-elderly type. So, what, what we did is out of this total sample, whatever is available to us has been segregated into three types of households. So, households which have only exclusively elderly members, so they accounts around 9% of the total sample accounting around 4,000 of cases. So households with, uh, with uh, uh, elderly and non-elderly members, so they account around 50% of the households and households which does not have a 60 plus member which accounts 41%. So while this, the, the, the smaller group is exclusively a, a group which involves the, which is, which uh, includes the elderly members, the other uh, other group includes uh, you know, both elderly and non-elderly members. A comparison of these three groups could shed some light to how elderly households vary by type of their economic well-being. So just for a, for a, for a background, I, I gave a few indicators which is we source the comparison across these three groups of households. As expected, the median age of this group with, with only elderly members is much older, is around 69 years. So it is 32 years for where there are both elderly and non-elderly member resides and it is much younger around 26 years for those households without elderly members. So this is and when you see the average household size, this also you can see the differentials in household size across these three as well. So as far as educational attainment is concerned, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a difference of around one year, one to two year from those households which are having elderly members because they are a bit older cohort and those are basically the, the younger cohort and you can see the differentials of around two years. So having to that, this is, this is my first key result which talk about the economic well-being of elderly. The, the general perception is that you know, elderly households have a higher per capita consumption expenditure than that of non-elderly households. 
But when you look in the lens with this uh, this domain, so what we found a little different uh, picture. So uh, as I said, so the analysis has been segregated by including health expenditure and excluding health expenditure. So the first key point what I need to focus is when you look into the uh, monthly per capita consumption expenditure, which is household consumption expenditure of an household size, is 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 you can see it was around three thousand eight hundred sixty-eight per household with only elderly members and three thousand household without elderly members. So a difference of around nine hundred rupees you can find when you do not exclude health expenditure. But when you exclude health expenditure and compare the well-being of of household with uh, only members and household without elderly members, the difference is narrowed down to 400 rupees. And among these three groups, possibly the, 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 the lowest, both in terms of with and without health expenditure, are the poorest group where elderly member resides with both non elderly members. So they are uh, MPC is the lowest, 2514, as compared to, uh, compared to the other group. So the, the key message what is emerged from here is consumption differentials of households with only elderly members and household without elderly members narrowed down when you take out, when you do the analytical structure excluding health expenditure, which the usually not done, our, uh, you know, this is what is it. So when you look into the, uh, the non-food expenditure as a share of consumption expenditure, you can see here this accounts around 45% of households. Uh, without uh, with only elderly members compared to 50, about half for the household with elderly and non elderly members and and similar fraction for for household without elderly members now look at the the second variable what we need to focus is regarding the the uh, the extent as well as relative share of health expenditure when you analyze when you see the per capita health expenditure uh, of elderly household household with an elderly member it's almost twice higher than household without an elderly member. So these two groups are directly comparable because this does not include a member who has a 60 plus member and this includes the members which have both uh, only 60 plus member. And this middle one is a group which includes both elderly and non members. The key message which is emerging from here, the per capita health expenditure of household with an elderly member is at least twice higher than household without an elderly member. Now, when you look into the relative share with reference to MPC, so what we find out the, uh, the health expenditure as a share of MPC was HIS 21% per household, at least one fifth of the expenditure of the household with an elderly member is being spent on health. So, as it is compared to 12% among household without an elderly member. This is marginally higher household with both elderly and non-elderly members. So the, 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 the message which flows from here is that both share and size of per capita health expenditure of households uh, you know, is, is at least twice higher than that of non-elderly uh, members. So now here you can look into the more closely how the distribution looks like. When you look into the distribution of MPC, with and without health expenditure. So this is stock of full gamut of the distribution. This is not merely focusing on any mean or or look at the certain characteristics. So you can see the this is the basic uh, you know PDF plot of MPC. The left panel is without uh, with health expenditure and right panel is without health expenditure. So when you see that this is the differences are narrowed down the the curve when you are you know when you uh, exclude the health expenditure to the curves becoming narrowed down and this is this is suggesting that so this is how uh, you know on um, the the consumption uh, differentials are are different and on a whole with the all sample when you look into this just a very simple uh, you know uh, way of seeing the health expenditure exceeding the budget share which is one of the major of uh, one of the methods for measuring catastrophic health spending. So there are two alternative approaches, both the budget share approach as well as capacity to approach to measure the catastrophic health spending. So I have tried with both the methods and the inference drawn from both the methods are robust. But here I am showing you with the what it, what, what it reflects with reference to overall level of population. For, a, for here, the, the catastrophic health expenditure means your out-of-pocket expenditure, that means your health expenditure less of reimbursement, 
divided by MPC less of health expenditure multiplied by 100 and when it exceeds 10 percent so this is usually labeled as, as a catastrophic expenditure so which is as high as 35 percent in the overall population among of the sample and when you increase the threshold level to 10 to 15 percent but still you see 25 percent when you go for the even 30 percent still you find that even there are 10 percent households who incur more than 30 percent of their expenditure uh, on on health so that that accounts their consumption you know, of the asa so but this is this is quite striking when you look into the analysis by the level of households when the household composition when you look at so households with only elderly members household without elderly members is the is the uh, uh, green bar and household with, with only member elderly members are the blue bar and the red is a mix of household with elderly and non elderly so at all level of threshold so this is this findings are again is is, is consistent suggesting that so even at the level of at the level of 10 percent which is commonly major so almost 44 percent of households with elderly members face a sense of catastrophic health spending and which is which at least 11 percent higher than in percentage point then household without an elderly so now when you look into this it goes with a different threshold let us say for the 30 percent which is which is relatively much higher so you can see that still one quarter of the households with only elderly members face the catastrophic health spending and it is just half for those households without elderly members so now the pattern when you look at the state pattern because so this is it is again it is it is it is it is quite you can see the results are findings are, are again robust across the states of india so it is irrespective of even the better of states or poorer states of bihar or better of state of kerala you can see about half of these households are inquiring to catastrophic health spending and in the uh, no, this is however the state variation is, is relatively much larger so ranging from uh, bearing and among nicobar from 17 percent to 55 percent so this is maybe because of varying regions so uh, no uh, putting at the at the at the, at the state level so now professor one of Mahanti, the, uh, yes professor Mandi, if you don't mind i think uh, another two minutes if you yeah can. yeah i'll finish that yeah i'm just okay. closing yeah. Yeah. So when you look into the uh, one of the key way to reduce the catastrophic health spending is the insurance coverage. What is happening at the household level? If you see that household with uh, only elderly members, only 19 percent of has some kind of uh, insurance compared to over 22 percent for household. This is also relatively lower for household without an elderly members. And it is it is more uh, when you look across the different age group. So it is as the as progression increases, the coverage of insurance declines. So with this, uh, this what the uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the certain key messages which emerge from here is economic well-being of elderly households is possibly is the artifact of analytical structure. So the way we construe the variables, the way the analysis is framed, for possibly need to look into more. Uh, uh, into that, as as we have pointed, uh, you know, analyze by by including inclusion and exclusion of variable. So, health expenditure accounts the largest share of consumption basket of elderly households, as we have uh, put for that. And the insurance coverage among elderly households remains low. And so, in overall, elderly households are vulnerable to financial shock. Due to uh, you know, low insurance coverage, early retirement, employment, and low pension coverage. So, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Mahanti, for your uh, vivid presentation and also holistically, uh, you know, uh, bringing out all the uh, economic aspects, which has uh, given us a, a very uh, comprehensive picture about uh, the findings that have emerged from this survey. I think uh, there will be many uh, clarifications. I am sure. Uh, Professor Sharif will, uh, you know, also add uh, uh, as part of uh, the discussions at a later stage. Now, I request uh, Professor Aparajita Chattopadhyay to focus on uh, uh, work, retirement, pension related aspects of uh, LASI findings. Professor Aparajita? Yes. Yes. Um, yes uh, yeah. A very good afternoon to all of you. Yeah. Uh, respected uh, uh, Professor uh, Raju. 
Professor Sharif. Uh, all dignitaries present here, my dear students and colleagues. It is indeed a delight for me to uh, talk on a pertinent issue that is having a very strong policy implications. So, uh, my slides are visible. Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, I will mainly focus on uh, different dimensions of work and social security aspect of the older Indians, as you are aware, why I'm writing older Indians, because last year covered 45 to uh, 59 cohort, as well as 60 and above population. So I will focus on both the sides uh, with relatively more um, emphasis on the 60 plus uh, work uh, dynamics. So, uh, First, my flow of the presentation uh, will cover the domains that we have covered in uh, work and work-related uh, social security. Then I will uh, mainly focus on the basic characteristics of the uh, work. And then I will pose uh, some simple questions with some arguments that um, we can derive from simple bivariate analysis existing even in the last year report. I am not going deeper into the analysis as I have been asked to focus mainly on the LASI findings given in the report. So basically we uh, followed the definition, census definition of work, that is participation in any economically productive activity irrespective of uh, wage. Uh, so work section covers three categories of people, those who have worked previously but currently not working, those who are currently working and those who have never worked. So those who have never worked, we asked a very simple question why you have not worked. An additional question is being asked to the female respondents. Uh, now regarding those who are currently not working but worked in the past, to them we are uh, asking about questions on their last job. That but majority of the time they were involved with, that is called main job. And those who are currently working, um, we are focusing on agriculture as well as non-agricultural work. And in agricultural work, if you, if you look at the three uh, boxes here, all these boxes are covered both for agriculture and non-agricultural uh, population. And uh, we are talking about those who are having a farm or those who are the owner of either agriculture or non-agricultural work, those who are employed, that means here it is agricultural laborer and in other cases it is mainly wage and salary workers, as well as family workers irrespective of their wage. Um, and to everyone, 45 plus, we put questions, some questions on the job search. Now, uh, you need to remember that LASI has given Special focus on the main job. Main job we have defined in the way where the elderly or 45 plus is engaged in majority uh, of their time. That means in terms of time we have divided main job and side job. 12% of the 45 plus population are also engaged in side job. Uh, okay, so uh, regarding the social uh, uh, insurance coverage, we have asked every working population whether they are covered under any of the social security schemes given by the government and specifically those who are availing those schemes, mainly 60 plus population, we are having some information on um, retirement, pension benefits and other social security uh, benefits. Now, uh, let's look at the characteristics of work and income. So this is the overall picture of uh, less than 60 and more than 60 population. Look at the total um, graph at the end. Uh, 60 plus population, around 36% are engaged, currently engaged in work. It is a substantial number in India. If you look at the rural urban distribution, definitely rural population are working more irrespective of their age compared to the urban population and it is mainly because of their um, agrarian based works. If you look at male female distribution, female work relatively less, we are all aware of that. But just to highlight here, those who are 60 plus, if you look at the male population, half of them are 
engaged in war, compared to 22% female population. Now let's look at the uh, distribution of the currently uh, working population, 60 plus. Again, look at the total graph. As I said, around 62% are engaged in agriculture and allied activities. You can get it from census as well as from NSS and LASI is exactly showing the same pattern. Those who are engaged in business work, there are two categories of business that LASI is emphasizing. This green bar is business owners who are having proper registration of their business. And the violet bar talks about own account worker. That means it is run by a single person, irrespective of their registration. And own account work plays a very substantial amount of workers among those who are engaged in business activities. Similarly, look at rural urban distribution. As I just now said, if you look at the business activities and wage earnings, that is salary and wage earners, they, they compose the substantial proportion of working class in the urban area. And among the business workers, the majority are basically uh, own account workers. Look at female, very interesting finding. They are mainly engaged in agriculture work. If you combine these two proportions, blue and red work, it is much more than male workers who are engaged in agriculture and allied activities, which clearly says that female at a higher level, higher proportion are engaged in primary activities and that too as agricultural laborers. The red bar is much higher than as compared to the male. So look at the uh, distribution of female work participation by states. I have taken 45 plus here. Average in India is 35. If you look at the census 2011, on an average, it, uh, female work participation hovers around 25 to 28. It shows some increase. Specifically, it is a 45 plus population. Maybe that could be the reason. But there could be some other reasons too. Is it because of feminization of aging? That means female population is more in the um, higher age groups. And literature shows that um, over the time, the workforce participation of older women has increased uh, substantially in India on contrary to the male workforce participation that has gradually declined over time in India. Uh, if you look at the state distribution, it is again following the NSS and census pattern. Um, many of the northeastern states, smaller states, Himachal Pradesh shows very high uh, female work participation. While again, western states like Delhi, Punjab, uh, Jammu Kashmir shows very uh, low female work participation. And it is uh, more or less matching with the 2001 um, census pattern. Now let's uh, look at different characteristics of work. Um, as I said, if you look at different characteristics uh, of the entire working population, 45 plus, majority are engaged in uh, own firm or business. Again, it, is, it shows India is agriculture based. And among those who are basically non-agricultural workers, it is interesting to note that places without fixed location is very important. A good proportion, which again indicates some kind of unorganized nature of non-agricultural work as well. Uh, regarding the um, business uh, enterprise, I said previously, if you see no employed business um, houses, it is almost 80%. It is managed by single person. And 1 to 20% uh, employees, around 20% business owners. Um, if you look at the distribution by sector, among the wage salary workers, 22% are engaged in government sector, while a very large section is engaged in the private organizations. Regarding duration of work, LASI shows that about 86% are engaged in six months and above. That means they are the main workers. Okay, let's look at uh, very um, rapidly the average uh, mean income from the current jobs. On an average in India, wage salary workers are earning more compared to other two broad categories. If you look at the agriculture and allied work, there is good variation in the monthly earning, highest in Kerala, 
lowest in a small state, Dataranagar. If you look at wage salary workers, the maximum variation by state is observed in wage salary workers as compared to agriculture and non-agriculture business activities. Again, a huge variation, lowest is West Bengal, highest is Mizoram. And non-agricultural business activities, lowest is Assam, highest is Tripur. Um, regarding uh, social security, as Professor Mohanty already hinted, it is the coverage is quite low. And this section is mainly talking about workers' social security. It is work-related coverages. So among the 60 plus elderly, only 7% are officially retired. We have defined official retirement means there is some kind of documentary evidence of cessation of work and around 6% are currently receiving pension. While those who are uh, working among them, around 9% mentioned that they are covered under work related pension irrespective of whether they are getting or not. Around 6% having provident fund, only 3% health insurance about 2% medical reimbursement, and these two are abysmally low, uh, employment insurance and uh, injury insurance. Now, if you look at the um, earning from pension, definitely the mean uh, monthly earning from pension is much higher than the mean of the uh, average income of the current workers. Uh, and it is quite uh, evident that the smaller states uh, the union territories and the states with strategic locations, the government pension, mainly the central government pension, uh, the proportion of population is quite high and the pension on an average is also high. Uh, similarly, state government pensions, more or less both the cases, it is uh, same, similar. And these are the specific states where state government pensions are at the higher side. Now, who works beyond 60? It is an interesting question and it is quite relevant uh, for the policy because um, the entire world is focusing on active aging and active aging means that 60 plus population are engaged in some kind of work. Uh, it could be social work, it could be income generating work. So the this particular component of income generating work of 60 plus may um, uh, deserve your attention. If you look at the existing literature, very confusing. Who works in India? Is it the poor? Most of the literature in India will talk about, yes, it is the poor who are working mainly and work beyond 60 is an indication of deprivation. Is it that less educated are, one, uh, are uh, working beyond 60? Because education, poverty are also correlated. Is it because they are living alone? The Western literature is quite different in this context because they say that elderly who are staying with family are more involved in work. Uh, we do not have clear-cut uh, direction of literature in, in India. Uh, is it because those who are not having social security are more engaged in work? And if you uh, know a bit of the uh, pension um, uh, protocols in the West, uh, pension reform in the West has changed the work dynamics beyond 60 in the West. Uh, we don't have much, lit much literature on it in India. Is it so that those who are having good health are working or it is just the opposite? Those who are having poor health are working because literature shows that who are having poor health to um, incur the health expenditure, they are more involved in work. And Professor Mohanty already mentioned this, there is a big difference of catastrophic health expenditure among those households who are uh, having only an elderly. So who works at 60 plus? Though apparently it looks very simple, but simple bivariate analysis that is existing in the last year report can give you a deeper uh, picture and can help you to do further research. Now first, we already know from the previous slide that main male works more and rural population works more. What about the other characteristics? Age. If you look at the age distribution of work, look at the red line that is males work participation, there is significant drop from mid 50s, though 60, 62 usually the retirement age, but the cessation of work is starting from 50s among men and the decline is more or less uh, similar in nature. 
which is quite different from female um, cessation of work. What is happening with schooling? If you look at the distribution of the current workers by education, you may not find a very good or significant difference. Relatively, those who are better educated or those who are illiterate are relatively less working, while the middle part is working more, but the difference is very subtle. Uh, now, about the health component, very interesting, whether it is perceived health, whether it is functional health, whether it is uh, reported morbidity, they are showing the similar graph and it is very significantly declining with increase or with decrease in the um, health uh, condition. Very similar to the age graph because age and health are highly correlated. Now look at the social security status. I am just highlighting pension status. Same thing will come with those who are having health insurance. That means those who are having pension or health insurance, they are working less in India. What about living arrangement? Very interesting picture. Those who are living with spouse, they are working more. The reason could be they are perhaps younger in age. What about wealth? We always say in India that it is only the poor who is working. Are you finding much difference? Among those who are working beyond 60, there is no significant uh, difference in simple percentage distribution by wealth quintile, which indicates again that across wealth, people are working beyond 60. Especially the work is even more concentrated among the middle part, that means poorer, middle and the richer class, they are working more. About life satisfaction, yes, it could be both way correlated, but I just showed the bivariate to generate your interest. Those who are low in life satisfaction and those who are high in life satisfaction, they are less engaged in work. The possible reason could be they are, they are poor in health or they are having um, social support or something for which they are not working, while the middle uh, uh, class who are um, who have reported themselves in the middle category of life satisfaction, they are working more. Very interesting graph that I just uh, tried to uh, uh, show it here. We asked a question about that at what age you think one person would cease work irrespective of their job. And it has been asked to 45 plus population who are working. Very interesting graph you can see that up to age 69, the mean value is well uh, within range. That means uh, it, it falls, the mean value falls within the upper and lower limit. While beyond this, it, it, uh, it gradually falls, which perhaps indicates that on an average, Indian population expecting to work till age 70. So is it rational or that time has come perhaps to think more deeper that whether the 60 plus is working is because of sheer deprivation or for something else. So the key point, 36% of 60 plus are working, 15% working at age 80 plus, which is a very, very good number in India. 35% female, 45 plus are working with wide state level variation. Female are working mainly in the agriculture and allied activities, mainly as agricultural laborers. Income in agriculture is lowest and even it is further low for female who are engaged in agriculture. Maximum state variation is observed with wage work. Majority of the business owners are basically own account worker, which talks about a very small business. 46% working for six plus months, that is their quite well engaged in work and uh, for 60 plus pension coverage is around 9%. There is no, no strong wealth or education gradient observed for workers who are working beyond 60. Health plays a very, very significant role beyond 60 to determine whether a person will work or not. So thank you very much, entire LASI team, wave one. All my research staff, especially who uh, work with me uh, to develop this um, work and pension section, all field agencies who uh, worked uh, sincerely to get the data, and um, everyone uh, present here for listening to me. Thank you.
retirement. Over to you, Professor Sivraj. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Professor Aparajita. Getting uh, the various issues related to work, retirement, and pension. Now I request uh, Dr. Deepthi Govil to present uh, the major aspects related to access and utilization of uh, uh, health aspects. Over to Dr. Deepthi Govil. Can you hear me? Dr. Hello. Deepthi? Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Can uh, Have you heard about from my side? Yes. Yes. Yes, please, uh, Dr. Deepthi, you please go ahead. Access yeah. and utilization. Yeah. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, my respected chair, uh, chairperson, Professor Shivaraju, discussant, Professor Shari, uh, Director IAPS, my dear colleagues and participants. I'm really very happy to share with you the major findings on healthcare access, uh, utilization, and healthcare uh, health insurance. So, primarily, my focus will be uh, on the findings which have come from the report. So, I will not be deviating from that. So, uh, before I get into that, I will be just telling you how the flow of the uh, questions look in the uh, uh, last seat survey. So, uh, so, we actually have uh, several questions on healthcare utilization and related to healthcare access. So, the whole uh, module on this issue has been divided into two aspects. One is related to healthcare access, uh, access to healthcare services. And then, going beyond the ask questions which are related to utilization of healthcare services and which actually has been talking about most recent visit to the hospital. Okay, so whether it is related to the inpatient care or related to the outpatient care. So uh, in case of the inpatient care, we have taken the reference period of around one year and for the outpatient care, we though we have asked uh, questions which are uh, actually going back till one year, but the analysis has primarily been done on the uh, outpatient care or outpatient visit during last one month. Fine. So, under both these two sections, we have focused uh, on the number of visits uh, and then uh, on the number of visits and the quality of services which they have received, along with the healthcare expenditure. And in healthcare expenditure, we have talked, uh, we have actually asked questions which are related to the outpatient expenditure. And in outpatient expenditure, we have entirely covered all the components uh, where the expenditure can happen if a person is visiting the healthcare institution uh, for any, any purpose. And then we have also tried to find out how they have actually got the, uh, whether there has been any reimbursement and from where then uh, they have actually done the expenditure on this uh, particular visit. And along with that, we have covered certain issues which are related to the health insurance. And there we have covered the issues related to the coverage and uh, who is the actually primarily the policy holder and how much money they actually pay to, the, uh, to get the policy and what are the different benefits and the facilities actually uh, they are uh, getting out of that particular health insurance coverage. So my focus, uh, the entire presentation of mine will be divided into three parts. First, I will be talking about the inpatient care. Then I will be talking about the outpatient care and further get, uh, getting into a uh, slide into the individual uh, health insurance. So if we uh, look at the inpatient care in last one month, uh, one year prior to the survey, it can be easily seen here that approximately 7% older adults aged 45 years and above were hospitalized in India during last one year prior to the survey. Right? So, but, and interestingly, the inpatient rate is higher among uh, elderly, which are aged uh, 60, and, uh, 60 years and above, as compared to the older age, uh, older adults aged 50 to 59 years of age. And it was around 6.3 for the older adults, uh, 45 to 59 years, and 8% um, 8 for the elderly age 60 and above. And as well as we also try to see uh, what is the proportion of old, uh, uh, elderly, which are 70 plus, are receiving uh, or uh, having inpatient care. So they turned out to be around 8.8%. .8%. So, uh, and 
if you uh, if we have also tried to see the inpatient care uh, rate by both uh, urban area uh, place of residence as well as by sex so it is very much vis clearly visible that uh, urban area uh, the it, uh, the inpatient rate was high in the urban area uh, which was around 7.6% and then the rural area and it was high among males as compared to females now getting into the uh, interstate variation uh, you can see very well clearly here over that there actually exists interstate variation in inpatient care there are around 19 states which have higher inpatient care as compared to uh, national average and there are around 16 other states which are having lower inpatient coverage uh, care uh, as compared to national average and uh, it is uh, it is the highest in himachal pradesh where which stands with 11.11 11 11% inpatient uh, rate followed by tripura which is uh, approximately 11% and then you can say that the mandiru but it is the lowest in Chhattisgarh and Bihar, which is just 3% and 4% uh, in these two states. So, uh, we, uh, what we did actually, so we tried to see the mean number of days which were for, uh, for which the people were older, uh, older adults were hospitalized uh, during the hospitalization. So, among those who were hospitalized, on an average, a patient was hospitalized for around 8.5 days okay so this was again very interestingly this was higher among the older adults which were of age 45 to 59 years but it was much lower around six days among the uh, elderly population fine so in case of the karnataka uh, the uh, on an average a patient was hospitalized for around 21 days which is the highest among all the states and there are, um, while only seven states have a mean, uh, higher mean than India. So if you see that, there are only seven states and all of them are approximately, they are the developed or maybe the, uh, the union, uh, one, two union territories are also there. So, uh, which has a higher mean than India. Rest other states, the mean range between 4.4 days in Chhattisgarh to 8 days in Himachal Pradesh. So, uh, we get into the uh, public-private distribution. So, this actually, this slide presents the inpatient care by type of health facility, especially among the elderly, age 60 and above. So, first I will be talking about the entire sample and this particular graph is only for the 60, uh, 60 years and above. So, uh, majority of the older adults which are of age 45 and above, uh, availed inpatient care from private facilities, which was around 62%, and 35% received from the public facilities. So, proportion of the older adults using public facility for the inpatient care was the highest in Tripura, which was around 86%, and the lowest in Jharkhand. Now, this particular graph refers to 60 plus uh, sample, and uh, we can see clearly here that the proportion of elderly using uh, public facility for inpatient care is the highest in Andaman and Nicobar Deep uh, uh, Islands. Then it was followed. Then followed by the Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, and only thirteen percent, and it was only thirteen percent in Karnataka where older uh, elderly received services from the public facilities. And this percentage was twenty percent in case of the. Uh, Maharashtra. So, Maharashtra and Karnataka were in the bottom of uh, availing services from public facilities. So, uh, further around 14 states and the union territories in India had more than half of the elderly using inpatient care from the pub, uh, public health facilities. Otherwise, majority of them were using uh, the private health facilities for the inpatient care. So, the uh, and the use of inpatient care from the private health facility was the highest in Karnataka and followed by the Haryana. And only 3% uh, elderly in Andaman and Nicobar Island availed services from the private facilities. So, uh, we have also tried to see uh, that why people actually are availing uh, inpatient care. So, what was the reason? So, this slide actually presents the inpatient care by various 
uh, diseases according to the selected background characteristics. So we try to see how the distribution actually looks like. So if you uh, see in general, what is the pattern? That non-communicable disease is the major cause for the hospitalization, particularly among the urban residents and the uh, men. Okay. So uh, around 63% were hospitalized for uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, so if you see the major cause among those who were hospitalized, so only we can see that 63% were hospitalized for NCDs, 21% were hospitalized for communicable diseases and rest other uh, around 10% were hospitalized for injuries. And this uh, pattern was absolutely true for all the status uh, selected characteristics, which is our age, which is the uh, sex and the place of residence. Then, uh, then uh, so the hospitalization for non-communicable disease was higher among elderly, urban residents and men as compared to their counterparts. So uh, if we go ahead into the mean out of pocket expenditure, so let us look at it. So the expenditure is actually being provided by the public facility and the private healthcare facility separately. So the mean out-of-pocket expenditure for the last inpatient visit to the private healthcare facility was approximately six times higher than the public health facility. So it stands at 52,022 uh, Indian rupee as uh, in the private sector as compared to uh, 8,877 rupees in the public healthcare facilities. So, and uh, again, it was higher in the urban areas than the rural areas for both public and the private healthcare facilities. So, the mean, uh, and interestingly, the mean out of pocket expenditure in the private facilities also increased with MPCE quintile. So, you can see a sharp increase in the richest quintile, which has gone up over here. So, uh, so now we will move into the outpatient care in last one month prior to the survey. So the overall outpatient rate in India was around 26% and around 24% of the older adults age 45 to 59 and 29% of the elderly age 60 and above act, uh, obtained or went for the outpatient care. So uh, the uh, it was highest. Uh, it's, it was higher in rural area, comparatively higher actually, not much higher, but higher in rural area as well as among females than male. So there is a contrast here uh, in between these finding and the finding from the uh, inpatient care, where the inpatient, uh, where the uh, females were having more, uh, less inpatient care as well as the people from the rural area were having less inpatient care. But here, if you see the outpatient rate is higher in the rural and the Females. So, uh, and uh, most importantly, among those who has actually availed outpatient care in India, approximately 23% adults, uh, uh, older adults, received outpatient care from public healthcare facilities, where 64% from private healthcare facility. So, interesting is that that uh, the utilization of private healthcare facilities, especially among the elderly, too, is happening uh, more as compared to the public health facilities, which is actually, it's quite alarming because they are, uh, are not in jobs, they are actually uh, not financially stable. And if they spend too much of money in private healthcare facility, they are going to face huge problem. So uh, we actually, this is the interstate variation in outpatient rate, which is pretty higher. And many of the Northeast states of India have lower rates with the lowest in the Mizoram, which is only 3%. The outpatient rate is highest in Punjab, which is 54%, followed by Kerala and Uttar Pradesh. So we have also, as I told you, that we have not just asked this question only for last 30 days, we have also asked this question for last one year. So the outpatient rate increases with the increase in the duration of the reference period. And the outpatient rate, if you see, it has increased from 26% in the month prior to the survey to 55% during the year prior to the survey. So, uh, looking at the uh, this particular slide, around 60% of the old, uh, elderly is 60 and above, and more than half of the elderly 
which is around 53% uh, older adults, which is around 53% sought outpatient care during last 360 days prior to the second. So, uh, and and then one more important thing is that, uh, just a minute. Yeah, one more important thing is that, that among those who have sought outpatient care, nearly half of them were treated for non-communicable diseases and 34% were treated for communicable diseases and 14% were treated for maternal and child health care problems and other type of diseases. Because we have a sample which is going beyond, uh, below 45 years or 49 years, th therefore the concept of maternal health is coming into this. The mean expenditure of uh, mean expenditure for the outpatient care for last 30 days was around 1,000 rupees, and it was higher among the uh, elderly, which is 60 above, uh, which is around 1,149, as compared to the older adults, uh, 45 to 59 years, that is 977. So moving towards the health insurance coverage, uh, yeah. Uh, it can be seen just like the health insurance coverage, uh, household health insurance coverage we have seen in the previous uh, presentation. The level of overall health insurance coverage among older adults, which was 45 and above, was around 21%. So the higher proportion of older ad uh, uh, adult men than women age 45 and above have health insurance. So men are more uh, insured as compared to females. And uh, the health insurance coverage was higher in rural India than the urban India. So uh, uh, we may try to find out why it is happening. So we will be seeing in the next slide. So and the older adults, uh, which is 45 to 59 years, and the elderly from the rural areas are more likely to have health insurance than those living in the urban area. So now let us see how the uh, distribution of the insurance coverage looks like. So among those who were insured, the coverage of Rashtri Swastha Bhima Yojana and the allied schemes was the maximum. So when we are saying the allied schemes, these are the schemes which were based uh, on the Rashtri Swastha Bhima Yojana and was launched by the states specifically for their own state. So we have clubbed them together and calling it as a RSBY and the allied schemes. So it was the highest the contribution was the highest and therefore if you see in rural area that uh, uh, that uh, uh, movement was launched in a very big way so the uh, apart from that coverage of health uh, uh, pri uh, private insurance which is the privately purchased commercial uh, commercial health insurance was higher in the urban areas than the rural areas so the difference is around 13% to 1% and the community cooperative health insurance in both rural and urban area was absolutely negligible, very, very less. So we have also seen the distribution across these states. And we can see that um, more than half of the older adults, uh, 45 and above, have health insurance in Mizoram, Odisha, Dadar Nagar Haveli, and Assam. Okay. So, and the presence of a strong therefore we can see that the presence of strong state sponsor sponsored schemes may explain the high rates in some of these states regarding the health insurance contrastingly if you go to the uh, bottom of this particular graph you will be able to see that less than there are few states which have less than five percent of insurance coverage and many of these states or the union territories are under Manikuba, Jammu Kashmir Nagaland, Manipur, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh. So this is all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Deepthi, for uh, presenting uh, the various aspects related to access and utilization of uh, healthcare services. Um, uh, I think uh, we have a last speaker, Dr. Sarang Padagonkar, who will be presenting on biomarkers and health status of elderly. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Sarang, Padagonkar? Uh, yes, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, uh, So I will uh, share my uh, content. Please go ahead. Oops. 
uh, good afternoon everyone uh, so i will be presenting the um, key findings on the health and biomarker uh, uh, sections uh, that we have uh, covered under the first wave of the rasi uh, so uh, uh, professor uh, tv shekhar has already explained about the various kinds of uh, health questionnaires and the information that we have collected and the types of biomarkers that we have collected so it will provide us the better estimate of prevalence of various kinds of health and uh, disease related conditions in the population so self reported prevalences are the those uh, where the people have reported these kinds of uh, diseases or uh, reported suffering from these kinds of conditions and which were uh, been diagnosed by some uh, healthcare professional uh, whereas the biomarkers are the one which have been uh, objectively assessed uh, during our uh, survey uh, with various uh, tests and the results were handed over to or the results which were possible to be handed over were handed over to the respondents so this slide presents uh, the self reported prevalence of uh, various kinds of chronic health conditions uh, that were diagnosed among the elderly that is age 60 and above in the lasi wave one and where we can see the most common diseases that were diagnosed were the uh, cardiovascular diseases and the bulk of which was coming from the hypertension Uh, which were followed by the any bone or joint related disorders diabetes mellitus any lung disease any heart disease stroke any neurological problem or cancer so the low prevalence of cancer may be due to uh, selective survival of the people who were able to report this uh, so uh, this slide presents the self reported prevalence of a diagnosed major health condition uh, by age and we can see there is a steady age gradient for almost all the conditions starting from the age less than 45 years that is which were for the spouses and which goes or rises up to age uh, 70 and above so we can see a uh, very good gradient for any diagnosed cardiovascular diseases or hypertension or bone or joint disease or diabetes and uh, chronic lung condition as well as neurological or psychological condition some deep fear uh, seen in diabetes uh, or bone joint diseases this may be due to uh, selective higher mortality among this age group beyond age 70 so that needs to be uh, that can be a good research question for further analysis of uh, data Uh, then this is the self reported prevalence of diagnosed cardiovascular diseases uh, by age sex and the uh, residents and we can see there is uh, this uh, typical age gradient and the prevalence is slightly more among uh, women as compared to men and the burden is uh, more uh, concentrated in the urban areas as compared to the rural areas nonetheless uh, in the elderly we can see about 28% they are having uh, any kind of uh, cardiovascular disease and these people have been diagnosed with this condition by a healthcare professional so this slide presents the self reported prevalence of diagnosed heart diseases uh, and the symptom based variations so for symptom based uh, angina pectoris uh, diagnosis we have used the ross questionnaire which is used which is a kind of objective assessment of uh, chest pain and the symptoms so as to identify whether the chest pain that is uh, person is suffering from whether it is of cardiogenic origin or not and we can see here the gaps are seen that diagnosed heart condition and uh, the prevalence that is coming from the rose questionnaire there is huge gap for the rural areas uh, whereas in urban areas the diagnosed prevalence is more among men again the diagnosed prevalence is slightly more whereas among female we can see there is gap between the some chest pain uh, which may be due to angina pectoris seems to be more as compared to the prevalence that is coming from the diagnosed condition overall there is about 1% gap uh, 1.1% gap in the prevalences of uh, diagnosed and the uh, the one that is coming from our uh, screening questionnaire then self reported prevalence of diagnosed hypertension among adults and we can see along with the age gradient again we can see uh, there is a consistent pattern of higher prevalence among female again this may be attributed to the selective survival uh, and there again the problem is mainly concentrated or it is uh, more prevalent in the urban areas as compared to the rural areas and overall prevalence is about 
then uh, this is the measured prevalence of hypertension means when the blood pressure of these respondents was actually measured uh, these people they were having the systolic blood pressure more than or equal to 90 or diastolic blood pressure more than or equal to uh, sorry systolic more than 140 and diastolic more than or equal to 90 so we can see overall 30 percent they were having the blood pressure in the higher range it means at a, at this given point of time uh, in the elderly uh, we uh, among these uh, last respondents there are 30 percent population is there which we need to uh, provide with certain type of antihypertensive treatment or medication so again the age gap the prevalence is quite higher among the people whose age group is 60 or more and again the prevalence is more in the people who are residing in urban areas and among men the prevalence is slightly higher so uh, this is a very uh, unique uh, kind of estimate that we are able to provide because of uh, the presence of uh, a major condition plus the self-reported condition. Here the hypertension we are uh, defining in the four categories that is which is adequately treated, which is controlled, which is under treated and which is untreated. So adequately treated hypertension is the one in which the person has been diagnosed with hypertension, the person is taking the medication to control the blood pressure and when we have measured the blood pressure in the actual survey, the blood pressure was within the controlled range. So we can see about 40% uh, of uh, the respondents, they were belonging to this adequately treated category, slightly more among female, uh, much higher uh, in urban areas as compared to the ruler and uh, this prevalence was also again higher among the people who are age uh, 60 or more. Now there is one category uh, that is under treated, under treated it is the one in which the people who have been diagnosed who are receiving the treatment but still their blood pressure is not within the uh, 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 controlled range. So uh, there are about 30 percent of the respondents uh, overall which are coming into this group and this uh, under treated proportion is more than among uh, elderly uh, is 60 and above and again uh, it is uh, more in the urban areas <coughs> and slightly higher among men and this is the category that is the untreated hypertension where the people have been diagnosed with hypertension when we have measured the blood pressure their blood pressure was still in the hypertensive range and they have not received any medication for the hypertension. This untreated proportion is more or less around 10% are such kind of people who are not receiving, uh, who have not received any treatment and the proportion is quite higher in the rural areas and the proportion is higher among men as compared to women. Uh, then we are having this self reported diagnosed diabetes all the prevalence is about 11.5 percent and again this proportion uh, we can see in the age group uh, with age the prevalence increases and there is slight declining among the people age group 75 and above uh, then the male are more likely to be suffering from diabetes as compared to female given the higher prevalence and again the prevalence is much higher in the urban areas which is almost three times as higher as than in the rural areas uh, we have uh, in anthropometry measurement we have measured the height weight and the waist and hip circumference so we are able to provide with the body mass index and the waist to hip ratio uh, so body mass in based upon body mass index uh, the healthy weight is which lies between 18.5 to 25 uh, of the bmi and almost 50 percent of the population uh, uh, in the uh, they are uh, they belong to this uh, healthy uh, weight whereas remaining 50 they are either underweight or too thin that is the bmi that is less than 18.5 or they are overweight that is the bmi more than 25 or above so we can see in the older age group the proportion who are underweight uh, is about 26 percent which is higher than than those who are overweight but when we are looking at this age group 45 to 59 the prevalence of overweight is much higher than those prevalence who are underweight which indicates that uh, as a whole our society is uh, moving towards the weight gain and there are the whole environment is such that uh, it is uh, uh, um, making people to gain weight then ruler urban differences we can here clearly see more than double the prevalence of overweight or obesity than ruler areas and again for underweight the prevalence is almost triple than that in the urban areas 
Uh, in case of female, uh, the proportion of obesity or overweight rate is much higher as compared to that of male. <coughs> then uh, we are uh, uh, we have also measured this waist and hip circumference, so we can have high risk waist circumference. And again, the better indicator is high risk waist to hip ratio. Uh, so here we can see, as compared to men, we are having about nine percent high risk waist circumference. The prevalence of uh, high risk waist circumference among women is about. Uh, 39 percent and high risk waist to hip ratio which indicates the abdominal obesity or the presence of visceral fat which actually puts the metabolic stress on the body and which predisposes a person to various cardiovascular and other metabolic disorders and associated mortality we can see there is a continuous high prevalence of high risk waist to hip ratio which almost touches to 80 percent across all the age groups or ruler urban differentiation or male and female again urban is slightly higher and whereas the high risk waist to hip ratio is almost similar among male as well as women. Then self reported prevalence of diagnosed chronic bone or joint diseases, we can see the prevalence there is a uh, steady rise and there is common uh, or the prevalence is higher among female which is maybe because of various kinds of genetic predispositions and we know certain diseases like rheumatoid arthritis which are common among female. And again, the prevalence is higher in the urban areas. Now, this is a self-reported prevalence. So, uh, we can say that this uh, uh, diagnosis is actually better in the urban areas. But nonetheless, the prevalence is quite high overall. Then, self-reported prevalence of neurological and psychological or mental disorders. It is around 2.2%. The prevalence is slightly higher in the urban areas. And as the age increases, the prevalence rises and particularly over the age of 75, there is rapid uh, rise in the prevalence of any neurological or the psychiatric condition. So, for male and female, the prevalence is almost similar. Now, uh, this is a very good finding that uh, presence of multimorbidities among uh, older adults uh, and we can see the proportion of older adults with no mortality which is about 73 percent in the age group 40 uh, less than 45 it uh, goes down to 42 percent by the person reaches age group 75 and above and the presence of uh, any single morbidity uh, which is around 21 percent uh, then that uh, that has uh, the prevalence rises to about 32 percent in the age group 75 and above and there is a steady increase in the prevalence uh, whereas the multimorbidity uh, we can see about 26 percent of uh, uh, elderly age 70 and above and about 21 percent of elderly age 60 and above means about one fifth of the population they are having more than uh, one morbidity at uh, any given uh, point of time so this is for age group 60 and above and there is some decline is seen this may be due to selective mortality then self-reported prevalence of diagnosed organ related conditions so apart from this diagnosed condition we have asked about the presence of symptoms of certain conditions and any organ related issues and the most commonly reported was the any eye problem it was about 55 percent of which cataract was uh, 23 percent and the any hearing or ear related problem was about 10 percent so we can assume the type of sensory deprivation that is prevalent in our elderly population uh, then the gastrointestinal problem were about 19 percent uh, complete loss of teeth was observed among about uh, 11 percent of the participants and any urogenital condition was found in about 8 percent of the population uh, there were uh, this uh, comprehensive international diagnostic uh, short form that is the CD scale was used to identify the depressive symptoms and based upon the score uh, we found that about uh, uh, 7 to 8 percent of the uh, our uh, elderly population they are suffering from probable major depression and this prevalence rises very sharply to 9.4 percent in among the people who are 75 plus so this is all quite uh, uh, prevalence uh, 7 to 8 percent prevalence is there of um, uh, probable major depression and uh, the prevalence uh, when uh, we can see uh, it is uh, quite higher in rural areas as compared to urban areas and if you can remember the previous slide the uh, diagnosis of uh, the any uh, psychiatric or neurological condition the 
diagnosed uh, self-reported diagnosed prevalence as higher in the urban areas so this gap can or uh, and this objective assessment it can indicate the gap or the undiagnosed uh, proportion in the population that is lying for neurological or psychological conditions among the elderly so again the prevalence is slight higher among female uh, in the age group 45 to 59 as well as uh, 60 plus and for age group 60 plus the gap between the rural and urban it widens <clears throat> then uh, percentage of older adults and elderly by various uh, types of impairments uh, so uh, we can see overall 11 percent of uh, uh, elderly they have reported any kind of impairment of which locomotor is the most common which is about uh, six percent mental uh, and followed by visual which is four percent followed by mental which is about three percent and hearing impairment it is about two point six percent uh, and uh, also we have collected the information about activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living and we have observed that uh, about 21% uh, uh, of the uh, older adults they are having uh, any instrumental activity of daily living limitation and the prevalence grows to as high as 63% in the uh, population is 75 plus and for any activity of daily living limitation the prevalence is about 7% and uh, this prevalence rises to about 25 percent in the age group 70 plus and uh, rapid rise up to 38 percent in the age group 75 uh, and above <coughs> and then because of these various impairments the uh, various kinds of supportive devices and aids uh, they have been used by the older adults and the most common uh, used was the spectacle or contact lenses uh, which uh, was about 33 percent and when we see the age differentiation the uh, all these kinds of aids and uh, uh, supportive devices they were more commonly used by population is 60 and above there is about 10 times increase for physical disability for uh, visual aids uh, for dentures and the hearing aids again the rural urban differentiation the proportion of population using these spectacles it was higher in the urban areas uh, particularly for contact lenses and uh, almost same for physical disability uh, then uh, in the biomarkers we have measured vision and we can say that about 28 percent of the uh, uh, elder uh, elderly uh, uh, they are <coughs> older adults and elderly they are having visual impairment and uh, about one third of age 60 and above they are having this uh, visual impairment and the impairment is more for lower vision as compared to distant vision and uh, about prevalence is for blindness is about two percent uh, then uh, one of uh, our uh, uh, biomarker of the uh, good biomarker that we included was the uh, pulmonary function test and based upon the pulmonary function test we could identify the prevalence of obstructive and the restrictive lung diseases among uh, older adults and elderly in India and here I am presenting the prevalence of obstructive lung diseases uh, which is about 9% uh, for overall in India and when we see the age-wise distribution uh, the mild obstructive or any obstructive lung diseases they are about 8% in age group 45 to 59 and uh, in age group 60 plus it is about 9.5 uh, the rural urban differentiation the prevalence is higher in rural areas which is very slightly higher than in urban areas and among male the prevalence is much higher as compared to uh, uh, females <coughs> so the moderate to severe uh, obstructive lung diseases the prevalence it is about five percent and again the pattern for the uh, mild or moderate to severe obstructive lung diseases it remains almost similar uh, uh, across age across regular urban residents and the uh, sex of the respondent uh, so with this i conclude my presentation uh, thank you very much thank you dr saran uh, for uh vivid presentation on uh, biomarkers and health status uh, especially biomarkers is a very uh, important uh, contribution uh, in this uh, uh, pro project i think that will give uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, scientific uh, database uh, for analyzing the health issues uh, now i request to professor abusalam sharif i i think uh, you are joined in odd timings i was seeing uh, our emails <laughs> yes so you are yes, yes. yes. i think uh, without taking much time i request you as a discussant please proceed thank you uh, professor shivaraju 
uh, it is an honor to be in this group uh, this night for me uh, when i was invited i think uh, i was not aware i about the timing but uh, uh, given the very uh, interesting topic i made it a point to wake up and be alert and awake uh, i'm so happy that i'm participating in today's discussion I again thank IAPS and the organizers to choose me for the as a discussant. As you know, uh, today's uh, presentation is so vast and so rich. And each session, uh, Professor Mahante on economy, Aprijita ji on uh, work and retirement issues, Yuppi ji on uh, health access and uh, Sarang on uh, biometric, each one of them is a uh, is a huge and very very important area uh, now given this kind of uh, vastness of and richness of these data i was surprised that today we have this kind of data available in india uh, those were the days when we used to do all india surveys and a few questions on morbidity and mortality uh, under the human development surveys but uh, I was surprised to see, I was not aware of the existence of these uh, aging survey. These are tremendously um, important and high quality data, data database. Uh, uh, but uh, let me uh, raise a couple of uh, general issues before I go to one or two specific on each paper. I, um, each paper is brilliant, brilliantly presented and uh, uh, very good data is presented. Uh, uh, so I, I would not have much of uh, comments on the specifics, but uh, I would like to make this as a kind of uh, general uh, presentation or comment on the framework and utilization of the databases. So my first comment is, uh, I have seen what struck me today is that as India is developing economically, it appears we are also inheriting some of the characteristics of the rich world. You know, something like the issues relating to aging population itself uh, is, uh, although it is a part of uh, demographic transition process uh, but it is also a part of uh, increasing life expectancies so it is just not that uh, we are becoming older but we are the older people are going to you longer uh, so this compounding effect of um, elderly and uh, the likelihood of living longer is a challenge that india is going to face and uh, this data very effectively and efficiently brings out that dimension. Um, the second uh, generalized comment I would like to make is uh, last one year we are facing COVID. Um, although uh, the data suggests that India has transitioned from non-communicable to non-communicable diseases, uh, but I'm afraid uh, COVID, the highest example of communicable disease, we all are facing, the whole world is facing. Uh, how much these data, these data are five year old, I know. Uh, but I think the second wave of uh, surveys, I think uh, Professor Shivraji uh, mentioned about it. I think. Uh, so would, uh, how will we deal with uh, um, this uh, the impact of COVID, which to me it appears that it has changed the way people live forever. Um, uh, so I I want to keep uh, I want people to keep that in uh, in in the future conversations and future uh, research plans. It is important to factor the effect of COVID especially on the study like this. I was also thinking these data, of course, we as academics are discussing. Am I audible to people? 
Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, these data uh, we as academics are discussing, but who would be the ultimate users of this data? I know this data is generated with a kind of financial support and expertise uh, from agencies, international agencies. Uh, I think somewhere I saw the name of one of my very old friends, David Bloom, in this report, and a few others. Um, uh, so, I, I, but who are the users? The reason why I am posing this question is, uh, in, in say about 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was hardly any morbidity and mortality data, uh, data, and especially on aging, there was very limited data. So now we have generated this data. Uh, I know under the field situation. This is self-reported morbidity. Uh, I presume it is self-reported, although in the biometric paper I read somewhere that you might have taken blood pressures, you might have done some simple tests wherever possible. Uh, but still, by and large, these are self-reported data. So how much of an accuracy the medical system uh, would, uh, would, would place on the statistics generated by this survey. So I, I'm just raising this as a general issue. Who will use this data? What for will this data be used? Uh, I see a few people using this data. Um, and by now, if they are not with you, they are going to chase you for this data. One is uh, the tripartite um, insurance systems, which are, which are not penetrated almost almost closer to nil in India. I, I was surprised to see very low penetration other than the government's uh, insurance scheme. Um, uh, I know the reason why it is uh, because 80%, uh, 90% of uh, labor force is, uh, uh, is in informal sector. Uh, however, the actuarial services, the, the actuarial um, professional, the, experts, they would be wanting to use this data. Uh, and also the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and also uh, the international agencies uh, such as the uh, WHO. And uh, I, I, I foresee these as some of the stakeholder uh, who will who will tap the, the usefulness of the data. So I'm just giving you some and directions. Now I have listed about five main comments. Uh, I have just uh, put these comments, uh, not necessarily specific to any specific presentation, but as the presentations were going on, as my mind worked, I just put something in that. The first comment is, I like the data and the data it is structured here. Uh, possibly uh, the comment which I'm making, uh, you might have in the reports and in the papers, may have already done it. Maybe you didn't have much uh, time to make presentations. I found and I know that there are huge gender differentials in these data. Huge. There are some talk about it, uh, but. Uh, uh, I did not get the feel of the importance of the gender differences uh, in the data presentation uh, presented in almost all the papers. Um, um, I, would, I would expect much more deeper or maybe a separate paper bringing, highlighting the gender issue. I know uh, many places gender has been brought, you know, hospitalization is low. Um, even in the old age, uh, the number of days of hospitalization is low, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, these are these are all some of the indicators of gender discrimination in it, which is is just not in work, but also in access to medical care, access to food. We have been talking uh, about this since we are born, uh, almost, uh, and still we find those gender differences very stark. The second point, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, 
I just wanted um, this is not an this is not a comment. This is a this is a, a, a query. Uh, when this survey has done a sampling, I know uh, sampling size uh, somewhere around seventy around seventy thousand households or something like that. Uh, the whole stratification is this data um, uh, because it is an aging. Was there a over sample of uh, households with uh, sixty plus? So I just wanted to know uh, to see how much of a disaggregation can we do? Can we do this disaggregation? Let us say instead of states, can we do this for some sort of agroclimatic zones? For example, for example, uh, is there a different uh, disease or aging pattern in Rajasthan versus, let us say, in uh, in, uh, in in northeast uh, versus uh, you know uh, different parts of the country based on not necessarily uh, administrative regions but some natural reasons. So the natural factors, uh, are there any indicators uh, uh, of uh, the nature affecting aging uh, and their survival and their morbidity? Uh, is there any indication in this data? And uh, in the sampling, were the, uh, were the elderly, uh, presence of elderly household over sample? It's a query, it is a, uh, information. I was wonderstruck that um, uh, in the in the in the economic data uh, that the food and non-food expenditure is approximately fifty percent uh, in this survey. Uh, is it possible for somebody to see either using NSSO data or some such thing? I think NSSO data probably can do whether these shares have changed over time. Maybe maybe uh, ten years ago or twenty years ago. Uh, and this would be a very robust, I know, I believe the data is collected with very great care. So you have data both for uh, consumption expenditure and also uh, data on direct uh, monetary uh, reporting. Uh, so it's good data in that sense. Um, uh, and because it is a sample survey, it is done under field situation. There are issues with respect to reporting and all that. But having dealt with that, can we use this? This is a good indication uh, to see how this food and non-food is changing for the normal households and the households with elder. I think this will be a great uh, indicator, a very quick data for policy planners uh, to, to, to track in a kind of longitudinal study. Now, um, there is also an indication in this uh, uh, the presentation is that where the elderly are present, the households are likely to have lesser income. Now, it is very difficult to understand this because um, the elderly, um, uh, so although they may not be working, but they have worked in the previous period. So, so. Uh, are these elderly unable to save for a rainy day for their own retirement? I'm just not talking of their retirement or a PF kind of or social security kind of savings, which generally happens in government employment. I'm not talking of that. But there must have been some sort of efforts on the elderly who are elderly today uh, for a kind of wealth transfer from elderly to uh, younger generation, uh, but there is a theory called wealth flow theory in the demographic transition theory, where we talk about it, how to understand the societies, we will try to see how the, how the, the wealth is transferring, whether it is transferring from parents to children or children to parents. Now, for example, India was very poor um, 20, 30 years ago, so the families needed child labor to supplement their income. So here is a case where children are earning to contribute for survival of the family. So it is the transfer of wealth from children to parents is one example, extreme example. Uh, now similarly, now I want to see is it possible to study whether there is a transfer from the elderly who are now uh, 
towards the younger generation. Uh, it would be interesting to see uh, because as India is uh, moving away from the low income to middle income category, uh, and also we are aiming to become a high trillion economy. Now, these are the important pointers uh, for the welfare of the household. Uh, and um, uh, I know uh, there are very uh, important presentation on uh, wor work and uh, retirement uh, um, presented by uh, Apritaji. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, a specific comment, I think, on that paper was, um, why old people work after 60 years? Now, I think this would be a very interesting paper on its own. Is it, is it, is it, the, is it the poverty or the lack of income which is making them? Or is it the breakage of the social security system which the family generally presents? Now, these were the days when we used to do semi-anthropological work in many parts of India, long ago, 70s and 80s. When we found out that the, that the elderly were under serious threat of survival, when their joint estate, so the timing of the division of property was the most in important indicator of what will happen to the elderly. For example, there is a culture in the uh, farming community that the family estate, the father owning uh, agriculture land in this case, that land could be split between brothers when the first first born child, that is the elder, elder son gets married. Now, there was a difference in the survival strategy of elderly when the family estate was split, when the first son was married versus when the second or third or the last son was married. So, the elderly were more happy, much better off when the family estate was split, not at the marriage of the first child or first son, but at the marriage of the last or later children. You know, you know, I know, I hope you are understanding what I'm trying to do. Now, these issues with respect to, you know, India is known, even the Western world, uh, a country like United States and Europe is looking to address the issue of elderly through the family system, through our culture, through our joint family system, and, and uh, uh, through our, uh, you know, respect to our parents, our elderly. Uh, which is so strong and, uh, and, and and these are very important elements of our culture which influence um, a good life uh, particularly in the old age uh, so uh, i i would uh, in that context i think it would be wonderful to make a exclusive study um, maybe data is already there as to why uh, uh, people uh, keep uh, elderly work after they retire or, or after they turn. And 60. To me, I would like to work until I die, even if I am 100 years old, because I want to spend my time productively. It may be just a choice. But maybe there are, there are situations where it is not a choice. It is, it is forced upon them to work. Um, I also know in rural uh, and the anthropological work, many women particularly, uh, you know, uh, where uh, grandmother was still alive and uh, older parents, uh, they would not say, keep quiet in the household. They will try to do one work or another. Uh, partly not just because they want to work, partly because they want to show that they are useful to the family. You know, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, I have uh, documented stories where the elderly are discarded. They are removed from the household because of the lack of the space. For example, I had an opportunity to find out where a uh, elderly sick mother was brought into the main outside veranda of the house uh, 
uh, near the stream uh, because they just bought one buffalo and that buffalo could not be tied uh, tied on the stream it has to be tied within the homestead to uh, to to ensure that the buffalo was not uh, stolen uh, so when the buffalo was brought in the mother came out because there was no space for okay now urban life we know we have very small houses uh, the families are building children has to get educated so when the elderly become uh, become uh, old and also along with uh, oldness when they become sick then it becomes a problem to keep them in the house so where do they go is there a system is there a social security system is there a, a government uh, system or community structure uh, which has provided any opportunities for the elderly to be taken care of under these uh, situations i'm just recollecting some of my observations which i have done my my life but um, i am sure that these elderly problems will be much much more severe and serious in the newly changing culture uh, and also and also that the elderly are going to be longer um now uh, one more uh, uh, very important uh, distinction was brought out by the pd was uh, the differential uh, the hospitalization um, and there is there are a lot of differences depending upon various characteristics so i just wanted to find out if you if this can be presented in the demand versus versus supply model for example um, uh, i think hospitalization i saw you know one state uh, i think it is uh, up was low uh, versus kerala was high uh, is it because in kerala you have uh, access uh, you have easy access to the hospitalization uh, infrastructure versus in up there is no infrastructure so there is no hospitalization so to understand this um, Uh, interested india is so vast uh, so to understand these differences we need to control for some of these factors so uh, the two way uh, um, presentation um, you know it gives us a certain amount of knowledge about differences but it doesn't really tell us much uh, as to uh, what kind of policy can we evolve or uh, build upon that similarly the access to public versus private particularly the gender differences is the issue of both demand and supply uh, so so these these are uh, you know the public and private inpatient services uh, so um uh, so now another uh, factor is i remember t n krishnan a famous economist he is the first person sometime in mid 90s uh, i recollect that he brought a very powerful paper at that time which influenced the government policy they say that uh, in any given year there are there are many households which come out of poverty but as we grow but at the same time there are a certain number of households which fall back into the poverty they were not poor they were they were above poverty but they will fall back into the poverty now uh, he analyzed the characteristics of falling back into poverty and the dominant reason was the health care expense so here is a situation here is a very rich data that which you know is it possible to link uh, not only the issue of uh, uh, issue of um, um, Uh, healthcare expenditure uh, for the all families but you can do that for all families and families with elderly together and see the dynamics how it is working so in 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 in, in uh, you know um, what is not very uh, very clear in the presentation was uh, the healthcare expenditure data did i uh, i don't know whether i was uh, uh probably the data was presented i didn't hear it you know the kind of healthcare expenditure as proportion to the uh, yeah i think in the first paper as proportion to the uh, total household income the healthcare expenditure data that's a very important data and uh, but there are three parts to that 
So one thing is the healthcare expenditure. There is a private expenditure. There is a there is a public expenditure that government does, and there is also a tripartite expenditure. And that means the insurance. So we need to see how this total expenditure, healthcare expenditure in India, if we uh, structure that into public, private, and tripartite, how those ratios are changing over time. It will be a very interesting study to do. And uh, my last point, uh, I think here is uh, uh, we we indeed are uh, moving our morbidity transition towards non-communicable diseases, uh, and especially I I am very interested uh, both for the normal uh, population versus uh, this one on obesity. I know there are a lot of data on diseases there. Uh, I have made my comment because these are self-reported data. How the medical and uh, uh, medical uh, uh, medically educated people, people, uh, health healthcare personnel take this data because they say this is not uh, uh, hospital based on hospital records, not based on. Uh, uh, diagnostics, etc. So they, they, these comments will always be there with you. But still, uh, the important thing is uh, obesity. Uh, how is obesity uh, moving? You know, is it is it going to be a major cause uh, in future? Uh, with uh, with these uh, uh, and uh, one more factor is in the biometric. The the whole issue of uh, vi visual uh, observation of locomotion. Whether uh, um, elderly are able to walk, are they able to, when they sit, are they able to get up? No, some of these observations could have been much more valuable for us. Uh, and uh, the, the, the simple nutrition test, uh, I remember that there were days that uh, we did uh, this, uh, the nail, the color of the nail, uh, you know, uh, which would tell us something about uh, malnutrition. And um, uh, there was also a method to know malnutrition uh, through night blindness, uh, which was more dominant among the girls in rural areas. This is the study of 1995 Human Development Survey, which I was involved. We brought this out. So these, these simple pointers are very important uh, because they are more uh, trustworthy, easy to observe, and easy to document, and reporting errors will be too low. Uh, and I would appreciate some such things uh, could be brought out uh, in uh, into your next round of uh, uh, next round of uh, surveys. You know, with this, uh, Professor Shiva, um, uh, I am yeah, so, so so happy and um, uh, uh, to be with you. And I thank uh, the organizers of this uh, conference and um, appreciate. Uh, if you have any comments on me. You are welcome. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Abhishek uh, Sharif. I think uh, you have uh, provided very valuable insights. Given the diversity, heterogeneity of elderly in Indian context, as you have highly pointed out, what are the differences, especially say gender differences, which we can uh, you know unite and we can focus on, is very very essential. And uh, furthermore, given the feminization of aging, which we uh, you know, are experiencing that more number of female elderly and especially among the aging of elderly females is occurring. So these issues are very important, how best the characteristics differ gender wise. Similarly, as you have brought out the administrative entity through state level analysis is different, but natural factors, which is very, very essential because whether it has a linkage with a pattern of aging, whether there is a you know living conditions of the elderly, the well-being, the intergenerational bonds, what are those changes in the community as well as the environmental factors, how it is influencing both micro and micro picture is very essential. So to that extent, decomposing the data to look into this differences, not necessary state-wise, but natural settings which we can work it out. That is another important uh, dimension which you have thrown light on it. Similarly, the you know uh, aspects which are uh, intergenerational bonds, how, for instance, uh, between children and uh, elders, 
wealth flow theory how it is uh, you know applicable in this uh, so that uh, the data can support uh, given the demographic transition that is occurring and like in the western countries as rightly pointed out that how is that to what extent maybe some states may have validation uh, validation can be there for this theory we can test it out with the data that is available similarly you know important aspect is whether which determines work status whether poverty is influencing or as you rightly said is it so is it a compulsion or is it by a choice of the elderly so this is another dimension which we require to see because most of the micro level studies have clearly mentioned that it is because of compulsion so now the change is occurring given the profile of elderly changing there is a lot of choice that is coming especially in the urban context especially in the organized sector people those who are retirees they expect that now this is the time for me to work and meaningfully engage you know with the, the skills that i already have so this is another important dimension which we cross the demand versus supply in the area of health utilization which you have rightly yeah. brought out i think these are all very very essential i am sure you know it is a you know the researchers it is a very wealth of information and also the different layers that are been there we can open up each of these layers given the heterogeneity what are these determinants what are the factors in which cluster of elderly which is applicable but we have to accept that elderly need not be treated as a uniform entity furthermore it is very simplistic when we are talking about 60 plus in one bunch so that is one essential so to the extent possible we have to start opening the layers within this 60 plus so that much more meaningfully and also as you rightly you know asked for whom this data is applicable yes you know this is a very important challenge because in the absence of data policies are framed in the absence of data programs have been designed and implemented now that the data is available we have to knock the doors of policy makers we have to knock the doors of program managers and we also should see how best the elderly issues can be highlighted with the data yes please yeah. one 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 uh, one point which i got in the data there is something mm. called a selectivity bias in the data reporting and that is there are households where at the at the moment on the date of survey there are no elderly there but probably they were there one month ago one year ago That's now true. they are not there see you need to control for these factors to to actually observe uh, the pure effects so Absolutely. i just want to clarify yeah, definitely definitely so those issues which we need to so they are all very important so to the extent possible now one good thing which is happening in india is that uh, you know ministry of social justice and empowerment which is the nodal agency to look after uh, well being of elderly especially the vulnerable sections they have a lot of inclination to and some resources have been provided so we are working in different working committees how best this uh, elderly issues can be brought in and bringing social inclusion and also you know bringing social justice framework for the elderly and uh, highlighting the un uh, parameters that have been brought out for un principles of elderly which can be applicable in india's context we are working and i think the data which will uh, will be very very valuable and uh, bring out these issues i think uh, it is going to be a wealth of information i want to say it is a huge challenge also to what extent we can have a in depth uh, knowledge of analysis that our research, uh, scholars can uh, throw light thank you professor sharif for uh, providing your valuable inputs on the discussion i think we have uh, immensely you know um, uh, utilized uh, your expertise and i think we will work very hard on that direction uh, professor uh, uh, sekar yeah uh, do we have uh, you, uh, some time for other participants or uh, just you can one or two one or two to come uh, uh, shaker uh, we have to start at yeah. shaker we have to start at 2 o'clock new session yes yes just yes, two yes, minutes professor venisa yes, yes. Uh, professor sharif and uh, professor shivraj was mentioned very important point just one one or two information professor sharif mentioned about the covid in wave 2 we are planning to have a separate module on covid what are the elder, elderly's experience with regard and what are the problems they face and how they overcome so we will have a additional module on covid on wave 2 we are working on that 
Uh, Professor Sharif also mentioned about oversampling of the elderly. In our survey, in order to ensure sufficient number of elderly, we have oversampled the 65 plus population. In every selected localities, four additional households with at least one 65 family member is included in that. Now, another big issue that is raised is who are the main users of this data? Uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is taking very serious note of that. Immediately after the release of the report, Health Minister called two meetings of stakeholders to discuss the various findings of the study and to take action and program with regard to national program for healthcare of elderly. And similar way, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment is also taking note of that. In fact, they have shown a keen interest to support the wave two survey of LASI because they, they think that the information coming out of LASI with regard to old age security, pension program and other things are very useful for the ministry. So they are going to support the wave to survey. And the gender differences, of course, uh, there is a scope for uh, further lot more analysis, but many of the things are highlighted in the report and we will try to do more analysis on the highlight the gender differences uh, with, with economic, health and social dimensions of elderly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Seker. Yeah. Now it is. Uh, uh, any conclusion you can make, Professor Seker? Uh, no, I have. I have just said because we have not much time. So yes. I'm just. Uh, I think so. We can conclude now. Yes. 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 Thank you, uh, Professor Sharif and Professor Seker and all the participants and also very good presentations uh, made by Professor Mohanty. Professor Aparajita, Dr. Deepthi, okay. and Dr. Sarang, I think it is a wealth of information that you have critically analyzed and provided very, uh, you know, in-depth analysis for it. And I think uh, the discussion has given some of the important sessions, which will greatly help you to refine it further and to see that it will be taken up further for publication and further dissemination. Wish you all the yeah. best. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Professor Sekar. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor uh, Shivrajo and Professor Shari. Uh, for yes. sharing this session as well as giving Professor, such a good Professor insight to especially for you <laughs> insight to you for you for coordinating yeah yes. uh, yeah and i i feel sorry for professor sharif to trouble him in the night but i feel his in inclusion in this session have strengthened the work of our institute by taking into consideration his inputs his uh, in depth knowledge about the aging as well as the suggestion for further uh, analysis. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Professor Sharif, again, once again, sorry for disturbing you in the no, night. Thank you very much. Yeah. My interest Thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank uh, you. Namaskar. Thank you.